Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Dylan and welcome to the Dayspring Wesleyan Church Podcast. The best way to stay connected to the life of the church is downloading our app. Simply go to the App Store, search for Church Center, and download the app and enter the information for our church. This will connect you to our church community. I pray the following presentation will inspire you to come closer to God in this journey of faith. Enjoy listening. God, may the words in my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock, our redeemer, amen. All right. One thing we, 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 being a kid's pastor and also a parent, you start to realize how much kids remember. So one thing we're working with really hard with our kids right now, the fourth through sixth graders, is that we are learning the Lord's Prayer together. So every night during a small group, we do another chunk of the Lord's Prayer, not just doing the words so they remember it, but also we're talking about, what do they mean? When it says, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. What does it mean, hallowed? And what does it mean to make his name holy? And what does it mean to give us today our daily bread? You know, we're talking about those things so that hopefully as they learn it, they don't just can't come to big people church. If we do it here, they'll know what to say. But hopefully you rememberize these things. They become a part of you. And then you start to believe those things. And then you start to act upon those things as well. That's kind of the goal of memorization. And the people who know this really well are those people who write jingles for commercials. They're nuts, but they're brilliant. How many commercials can you still remember from your childhood? And I would like to say, how many can remember the Lord's Prayer? But you probably know the jingles better than we know the Lord's Prayer sometimes, right? I mean, I still can remember some stuff. My kids remember some things. If I I would say to you, give me a break, give me a break, you're going to say... Break me off a piece of that. Yeah, that was pretty lame. Kit Kat bar, right? Okay, you got to go manly, which I'm not good at doing that. If I would say to you, best part of waking up. Some of you sang it. I'm impressed. Some of you are just, that's okay. But you got it. All right, I didn't get it. I understand it now because I need my coffee every morning. Back then, I'm like, that sounds nasty. Like, best part of waking up is Mountain Dew in your cup would make a whole lot more sense to me. (laughs) What if I said to you, I want my... There we go. Baby back, baby back, baby back. Chilies, baby back ribs. Barbecue sauce. Okay. (laughs) Was it low enough? Okay, good, good. What if I said... Um... I don't want to grow up. Toys R Us, kid. The million toys of Toys R Us that I can play with. From bikes to planes to video games. It's the biggest toy store there is. It's stupid, but I know it. I don't want to grow up. Because if I did, I wouldn't be a Toys R Us kid. More games, more toys. Oh, boy. I want to be a Toys R Us kid. I didn't even have to rehearse that. It's so much part of my life. And it's stupid. I did some of those first services. This one lady said, I thought you were going to do this one. I'm like, then she put it in my head. Okay? Meow, 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 Which cat food was that? Meow mix? You're still singing it too, aren't you? Because it keeps going. The words are so profound. They're life changing, aren't they? It's stuff that doesn't matter. But the goal is, is, is brilliant. They take a annoyingly brilliant tune, add words that mean nothing, and it becomes party. And the hope is that you say it over and over again. Then you start believing the stuff about it, and then you go buy their product. Really smart. Probably the one today that's sticking the most, at least with some of my kids, and I'm not saying this because they once were my employer, it's Burger King. Whopper, 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 whopper. Junior, double, triple, whopper. F- uh, f- whoa, 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 no, no, no. Flame grill tastes the perfect toppings. I rule this day at BK. Have it your way. Yeah, you want to, I want to hear it. You rule. Clearly, you don't believe that about me. That's all right. I won't take it personally. The guy on the song can't sing. You ever heard him? He's terrible. The, 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 the lyrics, they say whopper four times. They cannot think of any more words. 
Yet my freshman son sings it all the time. And I'm pretty sure once these commercials started coming out, we went to Burger King a whole lot more because they said it over and over again and they started believing maybe the Whopper is the best sandwich ever. So I started thinking to myself, best, best sandwich ever? Taste? Eh. To raise your cholesterol level? Possibly. But on top of that, not just the best sandwich ever, you can have it your way. Junior, single, double, triple, with or without cheese, lettuce, tomato, hold the tomato, pickles, mayo, maybe, maybe not. Because what Burger King has taught us, you rule, right? You walk in there, I actually might go there for lunch, see how many of you are gonna go and say, hey, listen, I rule, give me. (laughs) You told me I rule, I'm here to rule. Where's my throne? You say it over and over again. Then you start believing it and hopefully you start acting on it. Now, hold on to that truth from Burger King. We'll get back to that. So when you are the kid's pastor at a church and your lead pastor says, I need you to preach, I'm gonna be out of town and you're in the middle of a series, you have to preach on what they tell you to preach on. So I said, Pastor Chuck, where will we be in this whole crossroads series? Where these decisions that we make, these crossroads, just figure out what are we gonna do with Jesus? He said, you're gonna preach on Peter denying Jesus three times. <sighs> How depressing. What's even more depressing too is like, like, I feel like this is an obvious sermon. How am I gonna talk for more than seven minutes on a don't deny Jesus? Let's be honest. If you, well, let, let, let's read the passage and then we'll break apart where I was and, and where God took me. So we're gonna read from Luke 22, 54 to 62. Luke 22, I'm reading from the message version. You follow along in your apps or your Bibles. You can follow along on the screen or you can just take this in and hear God's word. Arresting Jesus, they marched him off and took him into the house of the chief priest. Peter followed, but at a safe distance. In the middle of the courtyard, some people had started a fire and were sitting around it, trying to keep warm. One of the servant maids Sitting at the fire, noticed him, then took a second look and said, this man was with him. He denied it. Woman, I don't even know him. A short time later, someone else noticed him and said, you're one of them. But Peter denied it. Man, I am not. About an hour later, someone else spoke up, really adamant. He's got to have been with him. He's a Galil- he has Galilean written all over him. Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. At that very moment, the last words, hardly off his lips, a rooster crowed. Just then, the master turned and looked at Peter. Peter remembered what the master had said to him. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. He went out and cried and cried and cried. Here's how this sermon usually is preached. Jesus is arrested. Jesus is going to be killed. While he's on trial, Peter notices this and Peter gets afraid. If they're going to kill Jesus, I might be next. And so he denies he even knows Jesus for fear for his life. So if you preach that sermon, you simply stand before people and say, okay, how many of you would deny you know Jesus? And every one of you is gonna say, not me, I wouldn't deny I knew Jesus. But then you step back and think, okay, the situation is a little different. It, you, whether you think this country's gonna have heading in a bad direction or not, I don't think any of us are gonna be faced in our lifetime with the possibility of a gun put to our head and say, do you believe in Jesus or not? So then you ask the question, if it was a life or death situation, Would you deny Jesus? And every one of you would say, I hope not. But then the question is, so why does that matter today? This is a message for a time and a place where you and I may never live. How does this change me? How does this transform me? How does it matter to me now? And then God said, context. 
Context is, is around. All of a sudden, things in the story that seemed to be obvious didn't make a whole lot of sense. Let's go to the passage just before this. Let's step back, not by the chief priest's place. Let's go back to the Garden of Gethsemane. Verses 39 through 50. This is still in chapter 22. Here we go. Leaving there, he went as he so often did, this is Jesus, to Mount Olives. The disciples followed him. When they arrived at the place, Jesus said, pray that you don't give in to temptation. He pulled away from them about a stone's throw, knelt down and prayed, Father, remove this cup from me, but please, not what I want, what you want. At once the angel from heaven was at his side, strengthening him. He prayed on all the harder sweat, wrung from him like drops of blood poured from his face. He got up from prayer, went back to the disciples and found them asleep, drugged by grief. He said, what business do you have sleeping? Get up, pray that you won't give in to temptation. No sooner were these words out of his mouth that a crowd showed up, Judas the one from the 12 in the lead. He came right up to Jesus to kiss him. Jesus said, Judas, you'd betray the son of man with a kiss? When those who saw what was happening, when those who with him saw what was happening, they said, master, shall we fight? One of them took a swing at the chief priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not tell us who one of them is. But John snitched. And snitches get stitches right now. End up in ditches too sometimes. All right. John 10, 18, 10. Just then, Simon Peter, who was carrying a sword, pulled it from his sheath and struck the chief priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Now, why did I take you on this journey back contextually a bit? Because sometimes context changes things. Let's just say that you would meet me at Walmart on April 6th. Why that date? I'll explain. And you're like, why is Bo not talking to me? Why is Bo just breezing past? Why does Bo look so, so out of it? Why does Bo have bad breath from not brushing his teeth? You're like, what kind of... Why does he take care of himself? And why is he such a mean pastor? Context. I just got done with an all-nighter with fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. I'm exhausted. I haven't brushed my teeth in 24 hours or more. We'll see. Okay? There's a reason. I'm not a jerk. I just haven't slept. And it changes the whole thing, right? When you know the context. Sometime for better and this for the worse. This doesn't, doesn't jive with me. So you have Peter in the courtyard denying that he knew Jesus. Why? Because he's afraid? But just a few hours earlier, we're talking hours, not days, weeks, or months. Hours earlier, he's approached by a mob of people. In that mob, we learn from other writers, other gospels, includes a band of soldiers Not just people with pitchforks. We're talking armed soldiers. And the disciples aren't heavily armed. We know this by reading from, where's it at? Uh, Luke 22, 38. How well armed? The disciples between the 11 of them with Jesus, these 12 guys have two swords amongst them. Because Jesus asked, how many swords do you have? They said, we got two. He said, that's enough. So 12 guys with two swords against a mob of people with armed soldiers. And Peter has the guts to stand toe-to-toe and risk his life by cutting off a guy's ear. What would it have taken a soldier standing beside the chief priest's servant to not just take his sword and shiv him? Right? And yet within hours, he's afraid of a servant woman sitting by a fire. That doesn't make any sense. Let's even go back a little bit further. 
to earlier that night when they're in the upper room. Verse 33, same chapter. Peter said, Master, I'm ready for anything with you. I'd go to jail for you. I'd die for you. He stands toe to toe with Jesus. I will die for you. A few hours later, stands toe to toe with a mob, which includes Roman soldiers, and risks his life cutting off a guy's ear. And then a few hours later, he's afraid of a maidservant and a few other guys that he might die. Haven't we crossed that threshold already? Where Peter really did risk his life for Jesus and now he won't? You see what I'm saying? It doesn't make sense to me anymore that fear was what caused Peter to deny Jesus. Hope you're, hope you're hoping I'll answer the question for you. <laughs> String it along. So what was it? What changed or what's going on if it's not fear? Here's what I think happened. I don't think courage is Peter's problem. He's already told, shown you he's got courage. Comprehension was the problem. Follow me on this. Context. Again, let's go back three years. Jesus is just launching his ministry. And one of the first things he does with these 12 men is he goes to a synagogue in Nazareth. The synagogue is like their local church. And he walks up front. He goes in and walks up front. It'd be something like if you came into church and it's just about time for Pastor Chuck to get up here and all of a sudden, oh, I don't know, Dean Bishop walks up here. Yeah, okay, good, you're paying attention. I thought you fell asleep on me, Dean. Kidding. Dean Bishop walks up, opens up the Bible and starts reading. You'd be like, who is this man? And what does he think he's doing? Okay? Context. Let me read from Luke chapter 4, verse 16. He, Jesus, stood up to read. And a scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, I am him. I am here. The spirit is on me. To, the spirit has anointed me to proclaim good news. I have been sent to proclaim freedom to prisoners. I have been sent to help recover sight for the blind. I have been sent to set the oppressed free. Now, hold it. What Jesus is saying and what Peter is hearing are two different things. Because the way Jesus would rule and the way Peter would have him rule and the way Peter would rule are two different things. Jesus is preaching and teaching about a new kingdom that is rooted in a restored relationship with God, that comes about with reconciliation and forgiveness and sacrifice. What Peter heard was the rise of a new Jewish empire, where Rome would be overthrown. 
Jerusalem restored, a new palace built, and Jesus would ascend and sit on the throne and rule a new nation in a new era with peace and prosperity. Why was Peter ready at the Last Supper to go stand toe-to-toe with Jesus and say, I'll go to the death? Because Peter heard, Avengers, assemble. It's time. The kingdom is here. Why was Peter prepared to go toe-to-toe with the soldiers? Because the kingdom is here. It's time. The revolution is starting. And why a few hours later does Peter tiptoe away from a servant girl, from a stranger, from guys sitting out here who aren't armed? Why? Because if Jesus is dead, so is the kingdom. Hmm. Let me try to explain. I just, just thought of this. I can be very embarrassing to my kids. Okay, listen. Especially my younger ones, but those are the girls. You ever have someone embarrass you? Someone you love, and you're like, I don't know him. <laughs> I don't know her. You ever do that? You know them, but not the way they're acting. Right? Yeah, that's the Jesus I've been following, but this is not the Jesus I was following. This is the guy preaching the kingdom, but this is not the kingdom I was following. Peter denied Jesus because this was not the Jesus he wanted. The Jesus he wanted was gonna pick up a sword, jump on a stallion, ride into Rome, kill the emperor, come back with his head. That's what they did to show that they're superior. Build a, new, to build a new city, build a new palace and ascend to a throne. The Jesus he wanted was gonna make Israel safe, powerful, prosperous. The Jesus Peter got said, turn the other cheek, not take up the sword. The Jesus Peter got was take a step out on the water and trust me, not jump on a horse and let's ride. The Jesus Peter got was love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, forgive the unforgivable, love the unlovable, look out for the poor and the needy among you. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love yourself like your God made you perfect. Not let's start a revolution. The Jesus he got was not going to ascend to a throne, but ascend to a cross. That's not the Jesus Peter wanted. That's not the Jesus Peter thought he knew. The conflict in Peter is the conflict that that Burger King commercial teaches us. If Peter rules this kingdom, he'll have it his way. But if Christ is going to rule, we have to have it his way. And when we are trying to build our kingdom in his kingdom, we will be at constant conflict with him because they don't align. What's that mean? What do you you mean, Bo? 
I've been working hard. The last few days of this, I'm trying, like, how do I put flesh on this to show you the conflict? The conflict is this. It starts with the fact that we deny the Jesus who is, and we start to create the Jesus that we want. And you'll know full well if you're doing this, if how you're living is aligning or not with the very words that he says. What's it look like? Okay. Jobs are something most of you have had, or do have, will have. Okay. If you're going to do it your way, because you rule, job gets hard, Boss is a jerk, pays not enough, hours stink. Have it your way, you go give the boss an earful. Give me a raise. I'll leave, even if the other job has worse hours and pulls you away from family more, because if we're going to have it our way, we're going to be happy. But if you're going to have it his way, maybe he's asking you to, yeah, that boss is a jerk context. Why is he a jerk? Maybe his dad was beating on him as a kid. Can't make anybody happy. So he acts out just like dad did. Have your heart break for him. Pray for him. Stick it out. Don't change your job. Your kids need you at home. You see the conflict there? His way, your way. Love your enemy. Some of your parents, I feel this. Kid doesn't get enough playing time. She didn't get the solo, the part in the musical. Her grades aren't what you think she deserves or he deserves. What do you do? (laughs) Go give the coach an earful. Send a nasty email. Let her know what you think. Email the teacher. Go to the, su- go to the principal. Go to the, go to the superintendent. Because if my kid's not happy, I'm not happy. And we're supposed to be happy. What about teaching in this conflict the fact that Jesus said in this world you will have trouble? How do you persevere? Maybe the kid actually is the problem. He needs to work harder. How can you teach him that? See the conflict? Doing it Jesus' way? If he rules or you rule in marriage, he's not passionate about anything. He's never around. She doesn't keep the house clean. She's not affectionate anymore. She's not encouraging. Marriage is supposed to make us happy. If I have it my way, I give her the earful. You let her know she's not a good wife. You let him know, either by word or by deed, he's not a good husband. And if it doesn't work out, you just leave and start over because God wants us to be happy. But it was... God, through Paul, that said, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Looks like both are being asked to submit. Like Jesus. And let me tell you, I'm glad Jesus didn't do it our way because I'm more willing to submit if I know that it's going to get a payoff. I'm more willing to submit if I'm going to get what I want. I know I'm not wrong in this. If that's what would have drove Jesus to the cross, hmm. Because you know Jesus died on the cross for all people at all time in hopes that they would come to a restorative relationship with their creator. And how?
how many millions, billions have not and have never taken up that gift. That sacrifice was not contingent on getting what he wanted out of it. It was out of obedience to the Father. If you're gonna love your wives as Christ loved the church, you love her. And it's hard. You love him and it's hard. Do you see, I'm not telling you what to do in all those situations. Oh, what about church? Conflict. It's not what I want. Some of you walked in today to this beautiful organ music. You're like, this isn't church. There's drums there. Why aren't we using them? Now, I could complain too. I grew up in a church. We didn't use instruments at all. It was four-part acapella. That's all we did. That's not church. Why is a youth pastor, kids pastor up there on a t-shirt? That's not church. Have it your way, you give the pastor an earful. Have it your way, you just walk out and leave and find a church that'll do things the way I want it to be done. Instead of realizing we are part of a body with Christ as the head. And as the head, the brain works, so we live. You see the conflict? beauty of being in a church when you preach is that I can say this one set of words that I have and the Holy Spirit is preaching over 200 sermons right now in here, in here. And that's why I'm shutting up a bit. I'm letting him preach. you're starting to know I can't tell you I don't know in each of you the Jesus that you're creating because he's not ruling like you'd want him to rule what stunk about this sermon is I think where's the hope in this it's depressing Good thing, Steve, you were the janitor that day. I asked Steve Hunt. I told him I was struggling. Where's the hope? Oh, man, the hope's at the end. So I'm going to preach Steve's sermon. I'm going to read for you just to listen to the last part of the story. Let me show you the hope. At that very moment, the last words hardly off Peter's lips, a rooster crowed. Just then the master turned and looked at Peter. Peter remembered what the master said to him before the rooster crows. You'll deny me three times. He went out and wept and wept and wept. Some of you are feeling guilty right now. Good. Because listen, guilt isn't a curse. Guilt is a gift. Because if you're feeling guilty right now, you know what? You've just heard from God. God wants to talk to little old you. And you heard that's why your gut's flipping. That's why your heart's burning. That's why your brain's breaking. You heard from God. What a gift that when Peter did that, the rooster did crow, that Jesus did turn and make eye contact. And Peter realized what he had done. He realized his guilt. And he cried and cried and cried. Because God, through Jesus, is all about making this thing right, you and him. He'll do it however he can. That's the greatest gift he can give you. And the best part of the story started right there with the rooster and the look and the tears. 
Jesus dies, comes back to life, a few weeks later appears to Peter and the disciples. And just as Peter denied him three times, Jesus allows him to redeem himself three times. Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, I do. To Peter, do you love me? He said again, yes, I do. Peter, do you love me? Of course I do, he says. And then 30 years later, it's not in the Bible, it's in historical texts. 30 years later, around 64 BC, there is intense persecution all over the Roman Empire that still exists. Jesus didn't overthrow it. Peter is boldly, along with Paul, traveling around the Mediterranean region, telling people about this Jesus guy. Peter gets arrested. Peter is threatened with death. And just as he once stood toe to toe with Jesus said, I will die for you. Just as he stood toe to toe with the Roman soldiers and took out the sword saying he would die for Jesus. Just as he tiptoed away from that lady and those two guys, Peter stands up to the Roman empire and said, I am a disciple of Jesus. And they executed him. Listen, listen, listen. On a cross. And he said, hold it. I don't deserve to die like my God. Execute me upside down. The best part of the story, church, is that Peter had the guilt and responded. The best part of the story is God spoke and Peter heard the best part of the story. He said, God has second and third and fourth chances. And Peter held up to his declaration, Jesus, I will die for you. And he did. Because he found out what it was to live like under his rule. And it changed him and it changed the world. Jesus, have it your way. You rule. Because listen, the Jesus that is not always the Jesus we want is the Jesus we, and I'm adding this, the world needs. <sighs> Stand with me. If you're feeling guilty, that's the spirit of God. If you're getting chills, that's the spirit of God. Don't let this room be the place you start, you stop wrestling. Don't go beat yourself up. Thank him that the rooster crowed this morning, that he looked at you and you caught his eye this morning. Thank him that there's a second, third, fourth chance for you to stand toe to toe with the evil empire of sin and death and hell. And he'll give you that shot to die for him after you give your life to living for him, with him. God, I pray that the wrestling continues home but not out of pity, not out of anxiety or doubt, but out of celebration that you talk to us, God. Huh. Your ways are higher than our ways. I don't know how you do it. I can preach two to 300 sermons right now, but I pray that we would be receivers of the word and doers of the word. I pray that every one of us in a different corner of our lives today can look to you 
and say, God, have it your way. You rule. I'm tired of fighting. And we'll trust God that the grace you gave Peter is the same grace you'll extend to each of us. Because <laughs> that's the Jesus who is. It's the Jesus we want, and it's the Jesus we need. Amen. I really hope you never think of Burger King the same again. <laughs> Have a great week. See you next week as we enter Passion Week. We'll see you at church. Thanks again for listening. If you are located in the Marion area, we would love to have you join us at one of our Sunday morning gatherings. For directions, service times, and information about our fantastic children and student ministries, please visit us at dayspringwesleyan.org. That's dayspringwesleyan.org.